Hi, I am Aditya, um, and I am talking on amplifier stack. So, how many of you here are front-end developers? You understand when you say a development stack, right? Um, you have an editor, you have a browser, you have a build system, you have a test system. Generally, a set of tools that help you be more productive. That's what you call a stack. Uh, generally, people would say J2E is a stack or LAMP is a stack. Or your front-end developer in Chrome itself is a full stack in itself. My name is not Pi, he's missing. Okay. He loves setup, so do I. And I'm sure all of you do. Uh, you really need, you, all of you, I'm sure, when you get a fresh, fresh machine, you, you set up everything that you need. A browser, a test tool, plugins, like Firebug, Chrome, <coughs> etc. I mean, best possible things that you ever need, that's the first thing you get in, right? You all have setups, and you all love them. You can't live without them. So you're talking about setups today, and how to make them more effective. But before we start that, we'll get into our foundation as web developers. When we started, I am sure that this is like 95% uh, of us. When we started as web developers, first things, or at least JavaScript developers, the first thing we wrote was on click equal to this dot color equal to red. How many of you did that? And style equal to font weight bold. You did that, right? Everything was in line. One file, everything was there. And cool, I mean, back in college, man, look at my page. It has red, blue points. It is beautiful. But, two days later, you want to change the font color and you damn can't find the thing. Where is it? Because you didn't use the word red, you used some hex color and you can't find it. <coughs> so you said, okay, I should probably move out into an external CSS file, use some CSS rule, I should move into an external JS file, write some functions, probably I organize code a little better. So you created main.css and main.js. How many of you created main.css or main.js or index.js? We all did. And then included the script tag and then uh, then there was a library dependency because we started working on jQuery so there were two script tags and then somebody told backbone is really awesome and so is underscore. So four script tags. Somebody said why don't you use some web fonts? So there was a type kit script tag and it went on and on. You have like 20 script tags on a single page. And it's getting out of hand. That's level two. But level two is not over yet. We are still struggling with our own code. Main.js, we modified it, but we are not using any version control. So the new file is called main3.js. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody says, no, the application needs to integrate the social media. There has to be a social integration. So there was a SI files.js. Cool. Huh? Then somebody said, you know what, there should be a fourth version, so there was a v4.js. <laughs> and this guy copied everything from HTML5 all of there was a widget.js. <laughs> and it's all there. We have no clues on what these files do. We just keep including, keep bloating our pages. And we don't, we don't really give, give a damn <laughs> shit about how awful it gets. Until two months later, we have to fix it. And we can't figure out how to fix anything anymore. Because it's too haphazard, it's just chaotic. And we need to find a structure to how we deal with things. Essentially, if you're doing front-end stuff. We all need to find a way that it's not just a way that you appreciate, it has to be a way that everybody appreciates in common so that if anybody picks up your code two days later, he's not cursing at you. Okay, That's pretty common. I'm sure everybody, every one of you, when you pick up someone's code, especially front-end code, you start with a swear word. <laughs> so let's, let's move on and find peace for ourselves and everybody else, all our brothers and sisters. Okay. Own the browser. The browser doesn't own you. You do stuff and the browsers comply to it. Okay. Doesn't make it. So, this is Sunil Pai's structure. I don't accept it completely. I don't expect you to accept it completely. But what he says in general is, you should have a, a very good folder structure. You should care about how many JavaScripts will uh, this end up with, or how many CSS files you'll end up with. Just have a very, very verbose structure that anybody can understand. There's a templates folder which contains all the templates that you're going to use. It could be Jade, it could be Mustache, it could be anything like that. Um, you can also have uh, fixtures that I'll talk about later. 
you have let's say tests, which also I'm going to talk about later. Then a util.js, which will contain all the utilities that you need to do. You can have a folder called shims, where you'll probably add your HTML5 shims, things that are not available in the browser, but you would like them to be available. Organize your code. Don't worry about how many files they, these result in, because you won't be serving these files. As you saw earlier, we had 20 files, we're serving all of them. Let's not do that anymore. We have 100 files. We have a build system that will concatenate, compress, optimize our code, and we just serve that. Let's just focus on coding. Keep serving part to the deployment part. Okay. Two different things. Pixels. Pixels are awesome. They really are. Uh, any Java developers around? Any .NET developers around? Any developers who have ever written any unit tests? So you have dealt with mocking and all, right? You have a service, you don't actually want to hit the network, you mock the service somehow. You say this input, get this output, right? That same thing is true if you want to develop for the browser also. Uh, how many of you work in a team where there were separate back-end guys and separate front-end guys? And you were the front-end guy. <laughs> and, and you had some data that you needed from the back-end guy. And every once in a while say, damn, your API is broken again. What the hell, I can't develop anymore. I'm going for tea. That, that's how it's always, that's how it always ends up with, right? Pictures a way in which you take a spec data. You say, I'm always going to get a data like this. You save that file, maybe in JSON format or XML format, unless, I mean, if you're back in 98, XML is good. Okay. Otherwise, take JSON, store it, load it in the page, and when you're developing, don't hit the network. Use this data to develop. If you're building a Twitter client, take a dump of Twitter feed in JSON, store it, load it in the browser, and make your client work completely with it. No network requests. You don't have to depend on third-party APIs. You don't have to depend on uh, the backend developers. It'd be amazing. You don't have to depend on internet. Brilliant. And it saves a lot of time. Um, I used to work uh, in an ad platform team in Yahoo and we had this a very well uh, distinction between front end and back end but we didn't have something like this. Every time I change anything in the back end code and the compilation took about 15 minutes and the deployment take about half an hour. 45 minutes if I want to change anything. And of course then we introduce this and productivity is short. The productivity is just short insanely. Makes sense, right? I'm a front end developer, I don't care about the backend evolving, I don't care about um, ROR, I don't care about Node.js, I don't care what the backend guy is using. As long as I spec out for this input, this should be the output, I'm cool with it. That's where pictures come in place. So pictures, pictures is actually one of the words for it. You can call it mocks, you can call it, there are a lot of terms for it. So there is a uh, brilliant MVC framework called JavaScript MVC. Okay. And they were the ones who introduced um, a jQuery plugin called dollar dot pictures. Okay. Don't go into this code, I'll show another code after this. Um, so this essentially says when you hit this URL, when you get a request for this URL, just use this picture. I have defined a picture called magic, just use that. Please don't hit the server. Okay. How many people use jQuery? Use dollar dot Ajax? Uh, had internet problems and got pissed because you're developing <laughs> and the dollar didn't work. How many? Go on the XHR request and wait for it to actually load and stuff. So everybody has faced, at least some of your faces, right? Okay. Can you read the code? Yeah. Okay. So it says dollar dot fixture method a root regex and function. What it says is Whenever I'll do somewhere after this, dollar dot Ajax or dollar dot get two two slash one two three or anything like that, just don't hit the network. Just call this function. Okay. When you call this function, you can just return some data. You don't have to hit the network. This will take care of everything. Magic, isn't it? You can do port, you can do post, you can do delete, you can do whatever you want. Up to you. Okay. 
And there's another beautiful method in the fixture plugin called make. You say dollar dot fixture dot make, and you say. Um, so what this does is it creates a, a fake data source for you, which is restful and uh, CRUD compliant. So you can do uh, get to fetch information. You can do post or date. You can do delete on it. You can do put all that stuff. And so if you say dollar dot ajax URL slash messages. And you can pass data saying this offset, sort by this, uh, limit so many, and you can do all that CRUD operations <coughs> on a data store in the browser, if not hitting the server. So if you are, let's say, building an application which has to show some 100 updates, keeping Twitter thing, or email client which shows 50 emails, <coughs> why, why hit the server? Why not just completely spoof? You don't even need information from the backend guy, you don't even need a dump. Just create it randomly. Just say random something, create random strings. Just fill it with random stuff. Isn't it brilliant? Most importantly, besides being brilliant, which is highly efficient. Hi. Uh, do we need to remove that picture while we release for product? Uh, no. In in that. So it kind of um, it depends on, um, I think there is a global variable which explains if you are in a production or not. So it, you don't have to remove it. If the URL works, it will take the picture. No, no, so if you are in a development mode, it will always take from that. Okay. You can kind of, what you can do is, uh, before you include the plugin, you can do a dollar dot ajax, as a, you can pull it out into another method called dollar dot old ajax. And then, uh, after you have included the script tag, you can, uh, write a method that function that which I showed earlier. In this method, you can say if this thing is undefined, then do an actual Ajax request, fetch the information. You can do a synchronous Ajax, you shouldn't, but you can. Just giving an example, uh, you can actually fetch the information for the first time and cache it. That's also a possibility. Okay, um, so it's great for if you're using any any of the NVC framework, Backbone, Spine, Knockout, Angular. Mm, the list is endless. There are so many MVC frameworks out there. MVC, MVP, so many of them. Why? Because uh, essentially all the MVC frameworks, one of the first criteria is you write entire app in the browser and you just interact with the server in JSON format or some format. Why not just save that format, cache it and just develop completely offline. So it's really great if you're developing an application with any of these frameworks. And if you want, so these Pictures also work great as reference points on what should be the output for certain input. So you can write your unit tests on top of these things. I mean, understand, right? When you're writing unit tests, you need some kind of references to for certain input what should be the output. So you can use this uh, dump as a spec to communicate between the front end and the back end team or a third party that's providing you the API. Speaking of which, how many of you actually write unit tests? How many if you write unit tests in JavaScript? Please do. One more. Please do. Very important. If you're writing, it's 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 very different from writing for Java or Python and all because those things at least compile and I mean, in the compilation world, things break in compilation. If you um, fix anything here and you introduce a new bug, there is no compilation happening anywhere. And you might be screwing up a lot of things. If, so you want to make sure that your code is not getting screwed by someone else, write unit tests. If somebody writes something new which screws with your unit tests, you can blame them. So also saves your app. You can just say, Who's <laughs> <laughs> Not me. So this uh, was something that one of Sunil's colleagues used to say. Fixtures plus unit tests is like Photoshop. Um, any of you have ever converted a PSD to HTML or JPEG or PNG to HTML? <laughs> Frequently, right? Uh, designer comes up with this multi-layered PSD and you convert to HTML and then you look at it again, alt tab, does it match? <laughs> oh, color is wrong, pick it again. It's a good reference point, isn't it? When you're building something, it's a, it's a brilliant reference point. That's the visual part of it. When you're building an application, visual isn't the only thing. There's a functional part of it. This is a functional Photoshop. It's a functional PSD. When you write fixture-specific unit tests, you ensure that anybody who's writing anything new 
has to comply to that design. Anyone who is breaking that can be easily caught. Anybody who is breaking that, there is a build script that will say, this guy committed something and it broke, please go hit him. And please carry your baseball bat. <laughs> Talks about how to write this, we'll skip this. So this thing, this talk is probably going to finish really early, so let's be more interactive. If you have questions, please ask. Okay, write new bugs, uh, write new tests for every bug feature issue that you get. You add a new button that shows a pop up, write a damn test, to make sure that it runs across all the browsers. Okay. You don't want your CEO calling you up 3 in the morning saying that I am in this presentation in San, uh, California and it doesn't work on I. It doesn't even work on I10 because you didn't test it, because you don't have, you have a Linux or a Mac box and you don't care about testing on I. Which is fine as long as it works on I. So there are many options available. Q unit is uh, used by jQuery. Any question? Yeah, if you are doing development in Java or any other languages other than JavaScript, the amount of uh, time spent on test cases or te unit tests is very less compared to the amount of test, uh, you know, programs we write for test cases in JavaScript. Like for example. Uh, we are talking about uh, different browsers and uh, one thing is that the second thing is uh, if you are using some MVC or MVR libraries like uh, Backbone and stuff um, how do you test the UI you know you are doing something so when you are talking about JS testing there are two aspects of it one is the typical functional testing which is the same as how you would do in Java Python anything else which is there's a pure functional expect certain or get certain output on certain input which I'm sure you understand how to do it, right? But you're talking about how to do the interaction tests, right? So um, what you do is what there there are multiple multiple ways of doing that also. So there are certain frameworks that let you simulate clicks. Uh, so what you can do is you won't. I will give just giving an example. You add a button that shows a pop up. Okay. What you do is you write a test that simulates a click, loads the entire page, simulates a click, and then um, sees if the uh, display property of that particular block is block or not is visible or not that's just it's not a good way of doing it but this is one of the ways of doing it um, then there is selenium you can use selenium to automate all your interactions so you interact with the ui in certain way selenium will record it and can replay it across browsers to make sure that uh, it works across everywhere it's just the same so interaction tests have different set of frameworks all together but uh, as you said takes time that's only because the, the learning curve is different it's not the same. There are async tests that you'll have to deal with. Let's if you're dealing with where there's a Ajax request. Even if you're spoofing it via fixtures, there'll, there'll be a callback. So the test has to be async itself. Okay, so there's a learning curve involved. It's not the same thing as doing in Python or Java. But once you've learned those things, it's pretty easy. Okay, so I was talking about QUnit. Um, jQuery uses QUnit. Um, Entire jQuery, all the methods tested in jQuery, I think they have 99% coverage, which is brilliant for anyone. 99% coverage means if you change anything and it's screwed up, it will break and some from somewhere ponies will come and beat you up. Okay, there's Mocha and Expresso, uh, which is works both on server side and client side, but they're more from functional testing side, they're not on interaction tests. Uh, really great if you're writing Node.js code. Uh, J, JS test driver, it's not JS test driver, it's JS test driver, it's a project by Google. Um, what it does, it's not a testing framework. It's a testing infrastructure where you write tests in some other framework and it will run all these tests across all the browsers. So, essentially, it will do all the testing for you. When you write tests, you just test it on one browser and this will take care of the rest. Okay. It works with Selenium also. Why do I test? Um, similar to Mocha, QUnit and all, does functional testing, does little bit of interaction testing. Yeti and Jute are setups created by Yahoo for just a JS driver. You write your test and then you uh, deploy it on multiple machines. So Yeti is this really crazy setup where they have uh, a few dozen mobile phones, a few dozen tablets, all possible operating systems with all possible browsers. Someone just goes and clicks and says, this test, run it on all damn browsers available. Goes, deploys to each one of them, all of them test and give a reply back saying, ta-da, done, 
So if it's broken on any device, you get a report. But you don't have to write for all the devices. You just have to write one test as how it should be. I mean, when you write a unit test, you're saying, this is how my code should work. Right? That's what you say. So you write your code as of how it should work. And this will tell you it's not working that way in any browser. And then you go ahead and look at the code, see what can be fixed. So if you're following any of using any of these, you're making your code bulletproof. There's nobody in the world, in the worst possible pro uh, programmers who can come and screw your code. The moment they screw anything, you can catch them in a moment. Okay, and Jasmine, the best, uh, one of the best uh, test frameworks available out there. There are many more. Uh, there is uh, vowels, and then there's a complete uh, paradigm of programming out there called DDD, where you write tests first. first and then, as I said, it's like Photoshop. You design everything, and then based on that, you write your code. So you write tests, everything will fail, because your code doesn't work the way it should. But then you evolve your code to make sure that it complies with the tests. As you said, it takes time. I assure you, it will take time one to maybe learn. After a while, it will get, take as much time as anything, any other unit test. But, after you've written the unit test, it will save you a lot of time. A lot of you uh, probably spend a lot of time writing or rewriting your code, right? Do you know this? What is this? This is a Rage Comics character, right? So, I'm, I'm sure some, some of you know Reddit, Rage Comics is now. Do you know who the moderator of Rage Comics is? John Rezek, the guy who wrote jQuery. He can write jQuery and he has time to do all this. Because he writes tests. And if anybody messes with his code, he knows whom to blame. He doesn't have to go running around fixing things. You'd be amazed how more productive you can get and how more time you can waste on procrastination once you write tests. You don't have to keep revisiting your code, rewriting your code all the time. Okay, next step. Move to templating. Stop doing that ABC plus XYZ plus 1, 2, 3. Stop doing that. It's really annoying. It's really unmaintainable. Write templates. Write templates that can be reused across server and the client. Write templates that can offload processing from your server to your browser. And write templates so that you don't piss off yet another person for doing plus 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 plus. I saw a person write some 8,000 lines of one JavaScript file. It was all plus 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 plus. It's, it's a maintenance hell. Somebody forgets one code somewhere and the entire file is screwed. Entire JavaScript is invalid. Don't do that. Please. Please don't do that. It's really irritating. What you do is you pick up any templating engine of uh, AJ, the mustache, the AJS. I like AJS because it works on the browser and the server uh, quite well for me. Uh, but there are easily 50 solutions available right now or maybe more. And you, as a developer, should decide for yourself what you're looking for. If you're looking for only server-side templating, stick to server-side. If you're looking for both, probably mustache or EJS. If you're looking for only client-side, JST is good. Underscore templates are brilliant. You can use underscore templates. You can use jQuery templates if you're using jQuery. Next thing, um, if you're writing web apps... jQuery template has been abandoned by Microsoft. JQuery templates is now external plugin. It's not in the code. So are they going to continue? So it's it's continued by the core developers of jQuery templates. It's not in the core anymore. It's just like how they are abandoning i6 support and it'll move it to external plugin. It'll still be maintained, but it doesn't go in the minimal file size. They want to reduce the file size. How how does this uh, templating work both in server as well as in client? So essentially, when you say templating, uh, you have these placeholders. Let's say curly braces and you can put name or double curly braces and put name or you can put uh, ASP like arrows and percentages and name inside it. So what it does is you write an engine that parses this page, finds these placeholders, looks up somewhere and replaces the values into here. So this thing can be done also on the server side and client side. So uh, let's say uh, Gmail, you use Gmail, right? uh, there's a new email. And this email can be represented as markup or can be represented as a JSON file. Uh, let's say there's a JSON record, some JSON object which represents the email. You have a template that renders how it should be. 
either you could render it using a rendering engine or templating engine in the server and send the HTML and the browser will just say dot and HTML equal to whatever or you can just send the JSON and the client, the client can do it for you right? and so you offload off, uh, offloading the <coughs> rendering to the client so when you do this uh, you are ensuring that if you are serving to something like Opera Mobile uh, you can just simply serve HTML from the server but if you are serving to something like Chrome which can render this for you why not just let it render for you the question I'm trying to understand uh, is, is about the data structure, which in the case of, for example, I use uh, uh, Drimpath JST very often, which okay. works on uh, JSON data structure. So but on the server side, you would be using a completely different okay. technology. So, uh, who's sending that JSON? Let, let's say I have a, a J2E server, let's say okay, so the previous model. Right? You have a server that does it for you. Right. So instead of sending it, you can put a check which says, if certain certain browsers which are incapable of doing it, okay, don't send JSON, use this templating engine which will not be the same implementation. There will be a templating engine for J2E, there will be a templating engine for ROR. Oh, okay. So you mean to say you convert uh, the uh, Bean data structure into a JSON? Exactly. Again, exactly, exactly. You are probably using a Struts plugin to do it, you do it manually. Okay. Next thing, backbone not which not exactly is my point, my main point is, uh, I think it's missing here, uh, such as the history again. I think it's later. Okay, uh, I'm sure you, all of you saw the JSON website, right? Yeah. Did any of you notice when you click on any of the links, the URL changes? Yeah, changes. Uh, but the page doesn't change. Yeah. And the URLs are still compatible, the search engines can still crawl them. If you look at GitHub, same thing. Gmail also, if you uh, refresh the page, you still come back to the same email. Kind of the URL kind of bookmarks where you are. Okay, So you're not breaking the web. So when the initial Ajax era started, people would change the content, but the URL stayed the same. And if you refreshed, everything was gone. Okay. So there are two things. One is uh, maintaining uh, bookmarking. Another is... Uh, I think I lost what I was talking about. Okay, I'll talk about uh, backbone.router. Backbone.router is a brilliant, brilliant uh, module in backbone uh, which wraps over history API if available. If not available, it uses uh, hash change. So instead of saying my URL slash ABC, it will be my URL uh, hash or ex hash exclamation ABC. Okay, so it, um, it still works on at least IA. Doesn't work below IA, but still works on IA and pretty much all other browsers out there. Yeah, have a question. Uh, okay, so uh, you said uh, you are using bookmarks for uh, generating different URLs so that you are not breaking the web. So uh, how does it work? Do you do you see do you do something like query the uh, whatever is left after the hash and then make an AJAX call directly exactly. to that thing? So you can either make an AJAX request or since when you are hitting the server you already know that uh, suffix. You can say if uh, request says is asking for resource one. Send resource one along, render it. You can the same thing which you're talking about. That's for can, history API. Huh? What are you saying is for history API? If, no, no, it, is, no. if it is a fragment, then yeah. the server doesn't know it here. Yeah, if the fragment the server wouldn't know it. In that case, you'll have to file a Ajax request. If it's a hash bang, then you'll have to file a Ajax request. Yeah, so for the fragment, you're directly taking it and then including it in the URL of your Ajax. Something like that? So let's say if uh, it's uh, abc.com slash um, hash hash bang pqr. Uh, so Server doesn't get the PQR. Yes. Anything after hash doesn't go. So, uh, so you see that there's nothing. This is just slash. Everything is missing, but there's a PQR. Ask the server to send me PQR as the JSON response, the HTML response. I either if it's HTML, I put it right there, or if it's JSON, I render it and put it. That's what you do. So, when the guy clicks on PQR two, you file another Ajax request and populate it. Okay. Okay. The point where I'm coming here is, uh, okay, it's like uh, touch dot Facebook dot com used to be there, right? Touch dot Facebook dot com. Yeah. Yeah. So they try to do something similar to this. What they've done is uh, they directly try to get the uh, fragment identifier and then directly put it in the dollar dot ajax or whatever library they use. Okay. And then they fire an ajax event to that particular uh, URL. Now, if you replace a fragment identifier with any random uh, URL, let's say it's a db colon slash slash attacker dot com. So what you can virtually do is you can make a oh, call. Yeah, there's you can make a call. vulnerability. There's definitely a vulnerability. Yeah. So but I'm just understanding like uh, how does it work without breaking the web? So is it like people? No, no. no. I, when I say without breaking the web, what I mean is. Uh, if you if you're coming from the old era of browsers, uh, 
you identify URLs with resources and every time something changes in the page you expect that the URL represents that okay with the history API that's possible okay if you refresh the page or you share the URL you still get the same thing across so if you're using github and uh, you go to a certain folder and you go to a certain file shows you that file but doesn't actually refresh the page and if you share that file and send it to someone else the uh, github server renders it at the server side and sends the html okay. you, you get where i'm coming from right yeah. and also the vulnerability is too even for uh, any other ajax yeah, yeah, request yeah, it's is just that it's thing all together it's, it's, I don't think we should be answering that here. Uh, uh -huh, that's correct. I mean, I'm just trying to uh, put in that point. Just that we had time. I'm just trying to yeah. bring in that point saying we shouldn't uh, be directly okay, carrying it. There's a vulnerability. Then. People can abuse if you're not. I mean, if you're not sanitizing your input, the Bobby table thing is going to happen everywhere. <laughs> okay. Then, for your space transitions, aren't they sweet? Things slide across. Looks better, right? It's not just about looking better. Uh, if I would suddenly change the entire page, you you would kind of get confused. The user will get confused. So use transitions to give a slight hint of what actually happened. It's not just fancy animations. It's sometimes it's great usability. Use them when necessary. Don't abuse them. Save state on the client side. Uh, let's say if you fire AJAX request and uh, you're sure that this resource is not changing for the next five hours, cache it. Use local storage. Use cache control headers. Somehow cache it. Okay. Offline cache, local storage, web SQL, index DB, so many options available. Use as much as possible to store stuff offline if it's not changing. If it's changing, do a request asking if anything has changed. If it's changed, order. Okay. <coughs> Just to add, but don't pollute the DOM. Huh? Just to add, but don't yeah, pollute don't the DOM. Yeah, don't pollute the DOM. Definitely. Yeah. Don't, don't, the don't give. Uh, mark, if you know that certain markup is going to get reused sometime, maybe don't hide it somewhere in the corner. Don't do that. Keep DOM as lightweight as possible. Probably you can save it in local storage and reload it again. So when, when you talk about uh, storing it on the local storage, would you recommend uh, storing the data structure, which is the JSON, and then re-rendering so, so, it, or uh, would you store the HTML? So the local fragment? storage spec itself uh, right now allows you only to store string key values. Uh, there's a, there is a proposal for uh, shallow copying of objects into local storage values. The keys will still be strings, but that hasn't been implemented yet. So right now, all you can do is just store strings. If there's an object, you serialize it as JSON. I understand that, but the question is, would you serialize the JSON uh, and then re-render, let's say, using some kind of uh, templating engine to generate the HTML, yeah. or would you directly store the HTML fragment which got rendered uh, directly into the inner HTML. It's up to you. Uh, I, it should work. I would prefer to store the HTML, but there is a 5 MB limit on local storage, which essentially means 2.5 MB because JavaScript is completely UTF-16. So if you hit the 2.5 MB limit, which is very well possible if you're using something like Facebook, in that case, you would probably try to keep it as small as possible, and JSON might make more sense. But let's say if a small application, HTML is definitely better because you already rendered it. 37 Signals has a mobile application, LinkedIn has a mobile application, and they all use all these kinds of things to make really brilliant mobile applications. You, I'm sure you, you would have heard, at least if not seen, heard about, it got popularized a lot, LinkedIn Mobile. They use Backbone, they use all kind of fancy stuff. It's not really fancy, it's really, really good stuff that you would be using eventually in a couple of years. Why not start using it right now? Deployment. I think. Should I talk about this or just keep it? Because I don't know what he talked about on that. Okay, I'll talk about what I feel is important for deployments. Uh, as I said earlier, don't be a miser when you're creating uh, JavaScript files. Don't be a miser when you're creating HTML, templates, CSS, or anything. Be generous. Create stuff as much as it makes sense. Don't overdo it. Just make as much as it makes sense. And let the build scripts take care of all the other optimizations. Don't pre-optimize your code. Be it JavaScript, be it CSS, don't worry about it. Just let the build scripts do its work. You are not a build script. Please don't write everything in one file. Please don't concatenate the code. Please don't minify it yourself. I've seen people writing functions which are more than 1000 characters long in one line. Why can't you make it verbose and let the build tool do it for you? That would make much more sense. So please don't be the build tool. Use a build tool. Um, 
automate as much as you can, which is not just building, but also testing. Um, use If you're using Git, use pre-commit hooks. Make sure when you're committing, there's a JS hint or a JS lint commit hook, which makes sure that you're not writing crappy JS. It will make sure that at least your JS code is something that other JS developers would like to touch. Okay. Please use JS hint or JS lint. It would be great if you can use it as a pre-commit hook. Um, continuous, integ uh, continuous integration. You have servers uh, where all the tests continuously run every, let's say, one hour. Uh, so when you commit, every one hour tests will run. And a mail will go out to everyone saying that that damn bugger screwed up everything. So you can know who to blame. So automate as much as possible, uh, not just your deployment, but also your code generation. There are times when, let's say you're using Backbone, and uh, there's a very high possibility that uh, when you're building a lot of similar kind of stuff, there might be a lot of similar kind of code. Use stub generators, okay, which kind of generates blank functions for you, uh, vague structures for you. You fill in the logic, so you don't waste time on generating the basic structure again and again. It generates a boilerplate for you again and again. Use uh, performance tests, use JSPerf. JSPerf, if you are confused of what you should do to concatenate strings, should I do A plus B plus C, should I do area A comma B comma C comma dot join, or should I uh, try another fancy trick? Um, there are literally, I think, six or seven ways of joining strings in JavaScript. And you don't know which one to use? Go to jsperf.com, create a test, write each one of them, run the test, take the test to another browser, run the test, share it with other friends, run it on every damn browser that is there, and see where it's performance. Don't assume, don't assume that certain thing that you know better is highly performance, or it will save more time. Run tests, run performance tests, and unit tests, and all kinds of tests. Use fixtures, use configurations, not only on the server side, also on the client side, use configurations. Okay, this, let's say logging, even if you forget to leave console.log in your page, it doesn't screw up because it's under a if debug flag. It shouldn't be, but at least um, use that much. Okay. Um, not sure what pages means. Um, develop boldly. Don't be afraid of trying new things. Be be strong, be bold, be forward about what do you want to do. Something new comes up, give it a shot. Doesn't matter how comfortable you are with backbone. If somebody says there's a new MVC framework out there which is much, much better, much smaller, um, much faster, go try it. Be bold about it. Not just about trying new things, also about writing your own code. Be bold about it. Have confidence in yourself. Believe that what you're writing is really good. Refactor slowly, refactor smartly. Make small changes. Go incrementally. Don't change 5,000 lines in one go. Please. Don't. If you're making any change, and if there's a unit test missing for it, please add a unit test for it. And even if this doesn't happen, last line, at least try to do the, make, make this happen. Try to make every website a single page application. Um, I think the last time I said that to someone, uh, they said, not everything is Gmail. Why do you want Engadget to become like Gmail? It's a magazine that just serves pages like any other website. But then I told him, have you seen Gizmodo? So what Gizmodo does is, you see, um, you know Engadget, right? Guys, Engadget, Times of India? Okay. <coughs> These are normal websites where you click and then the new page opens up. Gizmodo used to be one of those websites. Not anymore. Even Lifehackers. Uh, Lifehackers is the same, it's the same mark, it's the same code. So when you click on a link, if it's already, page is already open, you click on a link, if JavaScript is supported, Fireside Jack's request, Updates the history API, shows the article. It's a content website and even they are doing it. It makes sense. You are, instead of downloading not only the 50 KB of markup, you are saving all the unnecessary third party JavaScript downloads, CSS downloads, you're just fetching the JSON object, you're rendering it on the client side because server doesn't want to render it anymore and the clients can render it now. Okay, you are offloading processing, you are doing a lot of uh, good to your servers. And of course, Rakesh Pai built this tool for building his JS and CSS. It's a build tool called Sangam. Uh, go try it. Um, though it's a shameless plug by but I think it's a really good tool. I had a look. It's uh, Sunil Pai, right? Not Rakesh. Oh, I keep confusing these two guys, man. Uh, 
thing is there are about 50 of these build tools out there okay i don't say that go ahead and use this what i'm saying is go have and look at this the beauty of js and node.js is you can build your own build tools it's pretty easy and even if you don't use it eventually you get to learn a lot and i mean really a lot uh, that's it click to exit questions yeah five minutes five minutes questions how about page speed page speed page speed yeah Google Page Speed. Like, uh, yeah, Google Page Speed. It's a, it's a great tool. Like, uh, you know, uh, they rank, they rank your page and give suggestions. Can you use the mic? They rank your page and give uh, suggestions on what, what is more, what is the next important thing that you should do. Here. Like, how, uh, like, if you have a build tool, and uh, how do you make sure that this tool does all these things? So build tool doesn't do all of the things that page speed or wise flow or a web inspector audit tab will tell you. So they tell you certain things about concatenate and minify your JavaScript, which a build tool will do for you. Okay. Uh, a web inspector has an audit tab which will also tell you that you have unused CSS. So there are build tools that will remove unused CSS. Let's say if you're using Bootstrap. So there there are build tools that will remove unused CSS from your page. Okay. So so there are build tools that will take care of some of them, but not all of them. So let's say if, uh, uh, any of these tools say you are filing 40 HTTP requests. A build tool cannot take care of that. In that case, you have to go ahead, look back into your markup. What are those 40 files? Do you really need them? If there are some 36 images, you have to see if uh, you can use them as sprites instead. Use CSS sprites. Use images as sprites. It will save a lot of HTTP requests. What about combining uh, all the JavaScript, for example, you are doing backbone.js and you are writing? Yeah, you can manipulate all of them together. And and you're using several libraries, say for example, you know, when you're using 16, uh, uh, this was a real time scenario. We had you so like 16 JS files. You want to combine all the all of them into one. Right? When we just the thing is, not all of them. Uh, you you if you want to combine all of them, it's a great idea. Okay, if you're living in Sweden where the bandwidth is insanely amazing, great idea. Even there, 3G speeds are pathetic. Okay, so you'd be serving half an MB of JavaScript if you concatenate all the things if you're building a real application. Okay. What you should do is concatenate them logically into let's say four or five. So okay. Additionally load as per the ah, as, as demand load on demand and load on demand. And not, not only it's, it's not just about when you need a certain part of the application. Let's say if you click on settings in Gmail, uh, it takes certain time to open the settings tab because the settings uh, JavaScript is not loaded. When you click on settings it loads the JavaScript that renders everything for you. After that, if you click on settings again, it opens instantly. It's really fast. So, of course, there is one JavaScript for uh, minimal layout, then there's JavaScript for fetching the mails, then there's JavaScript for settings, there's probably uh, JavaScript for all the labs. Maybe there are four or five JavaScript files. So, you have to logically decide where you have to. You don't have to contact it in one file. You have to decide how logical it gets. A better example would be uh, I was doing a to do application lately where uh, I had to support Web SQL in the browser that supports Web SQL. Uh, index db in the browser that supports index db. If neither is available, use the Ajax packet. So uh, I can have offline application, but for people who don't have offline capabilities, you can fire Ajax request. So I don't want to load all the three modules. Each one of them is easily 20 kb. Do I really want to load all three of them and 60 kb? So I do a dependency check. Uh, I do a compatibility check, saying that this feature is available or not. If feature is available, I load certain dependency. So don't concatenate everything. Structure it logically. So we have all of these uh, bootstrapping JavaScript classes, you know, like modernizer, like yeah. head.js, uh, which loads these other JavaScript libraries. So do you think it's better to embed these scripts part of the document yeah, itself? Let's say you're using jQuery and, and uh, modernizer, put them in a single file. And you would want to load them into the uh, rendering server side page itself, or do you think it's better to load them as a CDN depends. library? Uh, so, it depends. Uh, let's say you're using something like RequireJS, where uh, or any, any of the AMD loaders, you have to, I'll probably inform offline about AMD loaders. Um, you have, want to have a callback when a certain thing gets loaded, which is not possible if you put a static script tag, right? 
So you, if you're using something something like a script loader, in that case, uh, things would be different. Okay, you cannot use a CDN. Even if you can use a CDN, it has to make sure that uh, it's certain version so that things don't break between one another. So are there other issues? Like for instance, if you use CDN, then during development, you still have to be online. Yeah, that's one of the right. things. That's things. one problem. So you use CDN, right. you have to be online. So, right. so of course, that is something that but you can the, the flip out. side of that also is that if you say building two different websites where you use the same library, then obviously CDN makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. The third part, uh, the thing that bothers me with uh, CDN is now. I was just I just forgot what I was trying to say. Some uh, CDNs screw up with caching a lot. Like meaning, screw up with caching meaning. So caching headers for. Um, I was going through, so there's an app called Wunderkit, which was really popular, I got, it was getting really popular. So Wunderkit um, uh, has, um, was loading images from Twitter, so you sign up with your Twitter, it will show images from Twitter. And uh, Twitter was serving the images with uh, cache expiry in 20 years back. So every damn time, there were some 50 profile pictures loading, and it was insane. There was no caching. So, I'm, uh, CDN is supposed to take care of these things. But there are high possibilities that somebody might be screwing up at that. So you have to trust them, which is something which I'm not very comfortable with. Trusting third parties, not very comfortable. What about DNS lookups? Again, yeah, DNS lookups is another problem. Hmm. I'm sorry, what? So if you're using a CDN, you have to do DNS lookup for it, right? Oh, DNS, okay. I'll probably share, uh, so on the proposal, I'll go ahead and probably add a link on the comments. Uh, hmm. You can go ahead and see the thing. It's an article on why cache, uh, why um, CDN resources are not that great of an idea if you're building the apps. Any other last question? Uh, often there is this. Uh, I mean, one of the one of the problems in developing a JavaScript application is that uh, there are uh, multiple dependencies with server side. One being, uh, you know, typically the JavaScript initialization variables come part of the server side rendering. Uh, you know, which means you know you have a username. Uh, which Something you need to use to for querying yeah. along with Ajax, that creates a dependency with, serve, with, with, the, with the server. And the second thing is, you know, typically you have the authentication, especially now that you have OAuth and OpenID authentication, you need to get some information before you can actually try and get some Twitter feed or something like that in your page. How do you write unit test cases which are closely dependent on other services Only and server uh, Let's say if you're talking about passing uh, server sending certain information and then you uh, uh, sending an idea for other for the request. Uh, what you can do is do one Ajax request initially, okay, and cache them in local storage. Actually, uh, so Mani's point is uh, particularly with Twitter. You know, if your app requires a Twitter login to work, okay, but Twitter is an external service. So how do you do you, unit you test? You mock now? them. You mock all of that. So when you uh, when you what happens when you do a uh, sign in with Twitter? Uh, the server requests Twitter for a token. Okay, sends back to you. With, uh, this is a URL. Hit this URL. So you hit the URL. You uh, allow. Then server sends back. Uh, you get another token, and your server says, "This was the first token. This is the um, uh, token you given me now. Am I allowed?" And Twitter says, "Okay, you are allowed. Take this information." That's how it works, right? But when the Twitter says, "Take this information," they give you JSON. Okay, they give you JSON. You can save that JSON and mock, use it as a mock. You, when you click on it, you don't have to go to Twitter again. You can just use that JSON object with the mock. So you can run this once, take the data you yeah, get. Yeah, exactly. Just... That's how I do it. I uh, kind of uh, save that dump, dump that JSON. Then when I'm using, let's say, a node server, I just do a console.log of the JSON object when the what succeeds. And then just dump it in a JSON file and reuse it wherever I want. Yeah, the, the problem is. What seems to me very often that uh, it, it is often sure, because hmm. I think it's time to wrap up. Right? Yeah, yeah, but this is something that I'm particularly interested in. No, also, you know, this 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 software. Software. Yeah. A lot of people interested in doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so, so yeah, typically, this OAuth works uh, at, at the time of execution, right? So, let's say I try to authenticate and I find that it's not authenticated, right? So, you at that point in time, you launch an authentication. So it doesn't happen that it always happens during the initialization. It happens between and it goes for an authentication and then comes back and then the JavaScript starts. I mean the JSONP I'm, or Ajax. I'm vaguely understanding but not completely. Uh, so I think I'll probably we'll sit together after this. And right. Okay. Yeah. I think it's, it's a little more elaborate, but probably all of this together. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, 
So this is about uh, JavaScript caching. Uh, they basically, if I put a long time XPS header and uh, my application is already loaded in the browser and then there is a next version which I have built. So what is the best way to uh, you know, reload it in on the browser? As of now, I go with a very complex way of handling you know, some kind of a, a get parameter. You know. I, I, is that the only way to handle it or is there a better way? That's one of the ways you can use. I mean, there's a concept of e tags which basically identifies identify changes. Okay, so when you define e tags uh, and you reload your page, instead of firing actually get request, um, you will be requesting if the file is changed or not. Serve only if changed. That's what browsers do. If you serve with e tags, so this is this is a really ancient thing. I mean, we've been doing since Apache one. Just make sure you serve right cache control headers. E tag is just one of them. Uh, what is one question? Yeah. Like, uh, this I encountered in a life project most of the time. Yeah, whenever we had too many JS files or CSS files, uh, the entire people was, were, were, was working fine. But once we minified and concatenated in a single thing, things were breaking. So, so there are some compressors that screw up your code. Okay, so this how happens to, to the bootstrap. The bootstrap code does not use semicolons anywhere. Exactly. So you run it through JS minute compressors. The code you written is bad and uh, your compressors are failing at minifying them properly. So what I'll suggest to you is make sure all your code is one written in a module pattern, at least if you're not using AMD. Yeah, but uh, uh, strict uh, ES5 strict mode enabled. Okay. And pass it through JS hint at least. If you comply to all these things, none of the compressors are going to screw up your code. But the moment you start writing bad code, compressors I mean, they are just lexical parser, they will screw up. <coughs> yeah, basically, these files I was talking about were the third party libraries. Not yeah, the Twitter code. Bootstrap 2.0, it does not minify. Oh, it's not just your code that's going to be yeah. bad. So, there are a lot of, uh, for a very long time, Google's AdSense was a really bad JavaScript example. Yeah. They fixed it in the last two years. They used to be terrible. They didn't even load it asynchronously before. So, is there a way to. Make what you do is, if you, uh, you take their code, you put it in a module pattern, put ES strict pipe or use strict in it, JS in it, get all the errors in it, mail them saying, what are you writing? <laughs> you expect third, third party people to use your code, this is what it looks like. Tell them, be honest about it. I mean, it's your responsibility and of course you're benefiting out of it. And you had one question, last question. Okay, the thing is, uh, uh, let's say you're creating a single page app and then uh, we, w we have s too much content in the DOM. So, uh, doing a lot of Ajax calls and then doing frequent DOM manipulations will result something like stop running this script sort of errors. So, either we have to clear the DOM and then accommodate new new set of uh, the tags or we need to do something like that. So, I, so I remember what you can do is you can detach DOM nodes. So, you, you uh, so of course, there's a new thing coming out shadow <coughs> DOM, we should probably talk about it later. But in, in a typical DOM also, you can detach nodes and put them into document fragments. You can, uh, what this is what I typically do is let's say uh, I have, uh, you guys have definitely created tabs or used tabs once in a while, right? Yeah. Okay. So let's say you have a tab, which, let's say five tabs and five panels under it. What you do is you do a div show height, right? Don't do that. What you do is you let, let all of them show. You just detach all the other panels, put them in a uh, uh, document <coughs> fragment. You can say document dot create fragment dot append child. Each one of them, the moment you append child them into the fragment, they get detached from the DOM, and voila, it saves a lot of uh, memory. It saves a lot of processing. I think no. could be a better option as well. That's another option. I mean, let's say See, you have problem? something pre-rendered and you want fast switching. You don't want to keep rendering it again and again. For a tab, the moment I click on second tab, I don't want to render entire. It's a huge log of something. I'm having. Let's say it's a log viewer. I don't want to render the entire log again. I can just detach it and keep it in. That's okay, one of the solutions. So why is detachment better than hiding? What does it do? So when you hide it, still in the DOM. No, but so what is the problem with the DOM? See, it's still it's in, the, like it's like in the DOM. It's in the DOM. Too many uh, DOM elements at a time. It's like uh, uh, it's like uh, I mean I remember Crawford saying that if the if the page is having more than three thousand elements in the DOM, uh, then we are probably doing what something wrong. Is, uh, when you have your DOM kind of uh, applied with your CSS, it creates hmm. something called a render tree. Okay. When you have a really huge DOM, doesn't matter if 90% of it is hidden, the huge DOM, the render time, uh, DOM tree to render tree uh, conversion is longer. So you have to check what is visible. What so is when you detach, it's taken off the render tree. It is off DOM tree. 
the so when you hide also. it when you hide it it's off render tree alone okay when you remove it from the dom it's off dom tree also it's a separate dom altogether called document fragment you can create okay. multiple so document. when you bring it back in it's yeah. rendered all over again there. yeah exactly so you don't you can't avoid the rendering part of it of course it's going to be on demand right yeah but also i mean it doesn't still remove it from the memory is in it you no, still oh. so it's, you'd be amazed majority part of memory consumption is not because there's a dom structure it's there because it has to be uh, rendered again and again into the render tree that's one of the most um, memory and processing the view thing you should uh, probably go ahead there's a video by paul arish about reflows and repaints you should probably go through it it's it's a brilliant talk so what what, what would happen if i say a dollar start dot length Let's say I'm using jQuery. No, if you say dollar sign, it will look in document, and if it's probably so in document, document fragments won't be coming into yeah, this. Yeah, document fragments are not in the document. They're separate. They're detached. I think that will be an ideal solution. I think we're done. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay, hey, so one thing all of you guys need to know: um, Aditya built the JS website. Now that's his work. And if you want to follow me on Twitter or GitHub, which I'll really appreciate, my handle is Netroy. Please follow me on GitHub.